Welcome to the Deakin Alumni and School of Psychology webinar with Dr. Tim Silk. Dr. Tim Silk is a cognitive neuroscientist specializing in pediatric neurodevelopmental imaging in order to understand the brain behavior interface, when and where that goes awry. Specifically, he's focused on identifying neuroimaging markers that can be used to distinguish children with neurodeve neurodevelopmental disorders, monitor progression and predict li likely outcome or treatment response. Dr. Silk studied his Bachelor of Behavioral Neuroscience and PhD at Monash University and the Howard Florey Institute. He then completed two years of postdoctoral research at the Queensland Brain Institute in Brisbane before returning to Melbourne to commence at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, where he was for nine years. Dr. Silk joined Deakin in April 2018, where he heads the Brain and Cognitive Development Lab in the School of Psychology. Thanks so much for joining us today, Tim. I'll now pass it over to you to begin your presentation. Great. Well, um, thank you very much for the invitation. So, yeah, in, in the Brain and Cognitive Development Lab, we're very much about using neuroimaging techniques to try and understand how the typical brain develops and then also when and where that, that can go wrong. Um, and today's presentation is going to be talking about um, a large cohort of um, children with ADHD that we've been following. And um, I, I, it'll really be de describing the cohort and then I will um, give you one of, the, present some of the findings from one of the key baseline papers from, from this cohort. So when we talk about neuroimaging, there are a number of neuroimaging techniques, but I'm pr principally going to be talking about um, MRI today or magnetic resonance imaging. But just to start off with, I'll give you a quick introduction to ADHD. I mean, everyone has sort of a kind of a, an idea in their mind um, what ADHD is, but sometimes that can be a little bit misrepresented. So I want to try and make that quite clear. So ADHD is characterized by sort of inappropriate levels of inattention and or impulsivity and hyperactivity. So not all children will be hyperactive and not all would be inattentive. There's a mixture of these two sort of symptom domains. Um, and there are different subtypes or, or presentations that the children can present with. So some may not have hyperactivity at all and, and purely have problems in um, maintaining attention. Um, and the reverse can also be true. Uh, it affects around 5% of school-aged children and that drops to about sort of 2 or 3% in, in adults. Um, and despite what some of the media says, that, that percentage is, is sort of worldwide as well as being quite consistent for the last 30 years. There is somewhat of a, a sex ratio um, so that it's more commonly um, diagnosed in males. And that can be up to about five times more common in a clinical sample. Um, and maybe two to three in a community-based sample. And the reason those are different is that so often um, those with inattentive symptoms without that hyperactivity don't get picked up quite as much, um, as well as females don't get picked up quite as much. Um, and so they get captured in a community sample where, whereas they're not getting referred to the clinics. Um, Above and beyond the, the symptoms that uh, an individual needs to, to meet criteria for the diagnosis, ADHD can really have a um, big functional impact on many areas of, of functional um, functioning for these individuals. This can be academic in their academic achievements, um, in cognitive domains. There's kind of uh, some common areas where there's cognitive deficits, but it's not necessarily the same for all individuals. Um, also has implications for their social functioning with their peers, um, as well as broader mental health functioning and different comorbidities. And a majority of these will have impairments that do persist into adulthood, um, even if they do officially remit out of their ADHD um, diagnosis, um, many of those functional impairments will still persist. Um, this is just a nice um, figure from a key paper which just sort of highlights these key sort of long-term outcomes. So there are a lot of um, sort of risk-taking type behaviours that can lead to sort of uh, premature mortality um, or other, uh, you know, higher frequency of car, motor accident, vehicle, uh, vehicle accidents and unplanned pregnancies. 
In terms of their academic achievement, is um, the uh, individuals are more likely to um, um, fail grades at school or, or be expelled um, or drop out. And this also then goes through into adulthood, so fewer go on to tertiary education or have more problems with finding employment. Um, in terms of the biological basis for ADHD, um, there are a number of um, studies that have found sort of clear environmental effects. And this just, just table just, just highlights a, a, a review of some of the studies that have found some association. But there is um, some clear, robust evidence that, of genetic susceptibility to ADHD. Um, this is through a range of sort of family studies looking at um, um, the genetics of parents as well, um, sibling studies where there's a higher rate of um, ADHD among siblings, as well as within twin studies, so a higher rate within monozygotic or identical twins. Um, and this overall heritability is really quite high. It's up around um, 7 and 7, uh, 0.75, which if you consider um, something like height, is around 0.9. So even though there's this strong sort of heritability, there's been no single gene that's been identified that, that has a strong um, um, causative role, but rather many, many genes that have been identified that might contribute a small risk towards ADHD. Kind of a um, hallmark of ADHD is its heterogeneity, its, its variability in the way that it presents. This is both in its clinical presentation, so I've already mentioned different subdomains of symptoms like the inattention or the hyperactivity, but also the pattern of comorbidities, so different uh, mental health problems that they might have. I've already mentioned sort of they can have different profiles where there's um, of cognitive deficits, um, and even whether and how they respond to treatment. Now, this is not unique uh, necessarily to ADHD, but across many behaviourally defined psychiatric disorders, there has been this sort of shift to, in, at least in the research um, realm, to sort of shift away from looking at these two supposedly homogenous groups, a clinical and a healthy control, to rather looking at how some of these traits might vary across the population. So what can neuroimaging tell us about mental health? I'll just sidestep briefly just to introduce what MRA is for those who don't know, just so we've got a clear picture. Um, magnetic resonance imaging basically uses a large magnet. Um, and the idea that um, water in our body, and particularly in the brain, it constitutes the, the greatest sort of mass within the brain, so nearly up to 80%, but that concentration is obviously different in different tissue types, such as the um, cerebrospinal fluid versus the brain tissue versus the bone. Now, water molecules are kind of like a little magnet. They're polar. They have a negative and a positive side. So when we put someone in a large magnetic field, these water molecules um, line up with that magnetic field. We can knock them out of that alignment with some radio frequencies, um, and as they return back to that alignment, we, um, we can sort of have measurements out of there that um, allow us to look at the concentration within those different tissue types, which give us the, the images that we see. Now, there are lots of different types of images or photos, if you like, that we can actually acquire from magnetic resonance imaging. So the most common will be the sort of structural images. Um, and the most common you can see there in the top layer is the T1 and a T2, but they have different contrasts based on, um, you know, or, or are used to look at different pathologies, what, depending on what you're trying to look at. And there are a range of others. And these sort of images can be used to be able to look at the cortical thickness, that grey matter that coats um, around the brain, and we can divide that into different particular regions, or look at the subcortical type you know, segment those structures out and look at the volumes. We can also have a look at function. So we can give individuals a task to do in the scanner and see what parts of their brain they're using to do that task, um, as well as what's being used um, a lot um, 
more recently is what's known as a resting state. So even if the individual is not doing a task, looking at the sort of fluctuations of, of blood flow and what parts of the brain are kind of functionally connected. We can also use the properties of how water diffuses to infer um, structure about the white matter, which is basically the telephone cables that connect parts of the brain together. And we can use this to sort of look at the whole brain tracks or particular um, or segment particular anatomical tracks of interest. And then we can also look at things like um, sort of the neurochemical composition of different regions. And there are many more as well, but they're sort of the most commonly used. So what can it tell us about mental health? Well, if you look at the top row of brains there, these are neurological conditions. And I don't think you need too much neuroanatomy to be able to see that there's something severely wrong with those brains. However, when you look at the brains down the bottom, these are sort of behaviourally defined psychiatric disorders. There's nothing that you can pinpoint looking at a particular brain that would assist in a diagnosis or be able to identify that individual having that disorder. But what we can do is have a look at the brain behaviour relationship. So this is a figure I like to show which kind of um, represents where I think neuroimaging fits into trying under understanding from sort of that molecular level through to the to the behavioural um, symptom level that we see at the end. So at the top there we have ADHD, but this could be any disorder. Um, and those disorders are a collection of, of symptoms. Those symptoms arise based on sort of deficits within particular brain, brain processes. Take inhibition, for example. Um, those basic brain processes you know, um, um, are attributed to particular brain structures or networks of structures that can, can have their own different sort of neural mechanisms. And in this example, I've got some neurotransmitters, but there are other mechanisms. And those neural mechanisms um, are driven by different um, genes as well. And then, of course, environmental factors can influence on a, a range of levels along there. So neuroimaging sort of allows us to, to look at the marker that's sort of halfway in between what's happening at the molecular level and the symptom outcomes. So, I mean, ultimately the goal would be to try and use this to, to aid clinical diagnosis and help reduce misdiagnosis. It's not quite there at the moment, but this is sort of ultimately the goal, or potentially, you know, parcelate different clinical subtypes or even identify precursors before onset happens. You know, at a research level, it's kind of on a group level, it's being used to try and whether predict whether an ind individuals will respond to treatment, but that's not something that's being used clinically at the moment. But what we can do is, is really understand, use it to understand the neurobiology underlying these disorders. So is it a particularly distinct dis entity or whether it's just a dimension across normality? Can we identify particular structures that are affected or networks of regions? Is it, is it lying in the grey matter or is it the white matter? Is it neurochemical? You know, what are the sort of, what contributes to the functional deficits that we're seeing? So now I'll introduce you to the Children's Attention Project, which is the um, community-based cohort, longitudinal cohort that we've been following um, of these children. This actually started before it was an imaging study. Um, and this, we screened over 6,000 children across 43 different Melbourne schools. And the aim of this study was um, to really assess the, the long-term functional outcome of children with ADHD. So not just whether they remit or not, but looking at their mental health outcomes, their broader comorbidities, their, their trajectories of academic, social and cognitive function. The really important thing about this study is that it's multi-informant too. We, have information from the child as well as a direct assessment with the child, information from the parents as well as their teachers. And being a community-based cohort, we actually have quite a um, representation of the different ADHD subtypes as well as both males and females, which can be both the sexes and the subtypes can be missing from a lot of um, detailed clinical studies that, that try and maintain a really tight homogenous group. We also get measures of the parents' mental health and the family functioning. 
And really the idea of this study was to try and see if we can identify a particular risk or even protective factors that are associated with an individual having a, a good or, or a poorer outcome. So I'll just go through um, some of the details. So this was the original screening of children. They had to screen positive by both the parent and the teacher. Um, and if they screened positive for, by both um, and they consented to the longitudinal study, um, they had a full diagnostic interview. And we ended up with a group of 179 children with ADHD um, and 211 controls, which were, were matched for gender and um, school. Quite of note though, I think it's worth, these children were around the age of six or seven when they were recruited in, in the first year of school, school in grade one. Um, only 17% of those in the ADHD group had actually had a prior diagnosis, clinical diagnosis of ADHD. Um, and then along the way, aligning with the third wave of data collection, we, we got another NHMRC grant to um, um, do MRIs on a subset of these children and so that we've now collected three additional waves of data collection where we're scanning these children in each wave. Um, these waves are 18 months apart um, so the scanning has started from around the age of 9 to 11 through to sort of 12 to 14 years of age. Those stars on the side indicate the points at which a full diagnostic assessment was run so that those diagnostic assessments were repeated every three years. Now we've we collected we've collected so much uh, very very detailed phenotypic data and I'm not going to list all of the measures we've collected but just sort of give a brief overview of the sort of domains that we've been collecting. So from the parent surveys we're getting information about the child's behaviour, quality of life, their social skills and autistic symptoms, because there's a lot of overlap um, in symptom domains with autism and ADHD. Um, treatment history, as well as socio-demographic factors. From the parents, we also get information about the family quality of life and um, the parents' mental health, family stress, different parenting styles. Um, and where possible, from the teachers, we try and get the similar measures, so once again, items on the child's behaviour and their social skills and autistic symptoms. But we also get some unique measures like the parent-teacher relationship as well as whether the child's using any school services. Then with the child we get measures of their visuoperceptual and motor coordination, verbal and non-verbal cognitive functioning, working memory, language, academic functioning as well as response inhibition and attention. And we also get some physical assessments like height and weight um, and in the, the later stages um, assessment of puberty. And we can also, we've also got some data linkage to NAPLAN results which is their um, standardised academic testing. So on to the neuroimaging of the Children's Attention Project or NICAP. Following this really nicely phenotyped cohort um, we started collecting multimodal imaging, so different types of sequences of MRI on a subset of these children, 180, um, at three time points with 18 month intervals. The so children would come into uh, the Royal Children's Hospital for roughly a three and a half hour assessment where we did a cognitive assessment, those self reports from the child, um, parent was there doing questionnaires, teachers were sent their questionnaires. Um, Children were trained or have a practice in a mock scan, which I'll talk about later, and then had an MRI scan where they're in the scanner for roughly 45 minutes. <coughs> uh, the aim of this main study was to look at the trajectories of, of how that brain structure and function change across late childhood into adolescence. But more importantly, I think the same too, is just how these different trajectories in their brain reflect different outcomes, not just the persistence or remission of ADHD, but the difference in functional outcomes across those academic, social and cognitive domains. Um, this image just highlights some of the, the key multimodal images that we're acquiring. So we're getting different images that look at structure, A and B there, a T1 and a T2. Um, C there is a QSM, um, which is quantitative susceptibility mapping, and this is quite um, a, a novel 
imaging sequence which looks at iron content within the brain. The reason we're using looking at this is that iron is high, highly concentrated within some of the basal ganglia structures deep within the brain that are really key for uh, cognitive and, and motor function. Um, and uh, iron is also related to or in quite involved with um, dopamine system. Um, dopamine being sort of a driving hypothesis um, in, in ADHD um, and the main neurotransmitter system that um, medication impacts. Um, then we also have a range of diffusion values which look at that white matter tracks and they're optimised for different uh, measures we're trying to, to pull out. And then we also have a, a resting state function, so looking at when the brain is at rest, what, what parts of the brain are, are communicating together. This figure just shows you the overall, we've just finished uh, earlier this year, our final wave of data collection. So we're, in total we have 471 scans, which is, for an imaging study, this is really quite a large cohort. This figure shows along the, the y-axis um, each individual participant, um, with each dot indicating um, the scan, um, with a, connected by a line for each individual. So you can see there is some um, dropout as we go along in time, but um, really quite um, a comprehensive longitudinal cohort. So as this is only just completed the longitudinal analysis, I'm not going to be really talking about any of those analyses yet, but they're still in the pipeworks. Um, but I will present to you some of um, one of the key papers that's come out from that baseline data, the first time point. But just before I do, um, I'll just highlight some of the issues and challenges working, trying to scan not just ADHD children, but children in general. Um, you know, the MRI is quite a medically intimidating environment for children and um, it's, you know, to it's a quite a challenge to get the sort of behavioural co um, cooperation. You know, we don't want the child feeling anxious. We don't want it affecting the, um, them. We also um, also don't want that that anxiety to mean that they give up and don't go in for the scan. And that ends up wasting a lot of research funding as well as the time of of the staff and the participants. But also motion is a really, really important point. I'll talk again on the next slide about this. Um, and so we need the children to keep as still as possible in the scanner. Children in general move more than adults, but obviously children with ADHD um, stereotypically move a lot. So this is a challenging population to work with in the scanner. And so having good preparation is really key for good quality scans. And we, we try and start this right from the recruitment. You can see up there in the top right hand corner, this was our participant information and consent book. Um, so this was sort of targeted towards even the children and the adolescents themselves um, to really engage them from the get go, rather than having this sort of big black and white legal looking document that the parents sign and the children have no real say over. Um, we really wanted to engage the children. And this worked really, really well. We um, ended up having the kids pestering the parents to call us to say, yes, we're going to participate. Um, we also have a, a mock MRI scanner at the Children's Hospital. So this is a full shell of an old scanner without the magnet inside. And this allows us to have a little session before the scan with the child, get them used to and familiar with that um, scanner environment, be able to play the noises. You know, it's a lot of loud noises that they hear so they can get familiar with it and get comfortable and reiterate the importance of keeping still. And so from um, the 180 we scanned at baseline, um, only six and failed to, to go through to the main scan from this sort of preparation, which I think is really good outcome. And then also we give the children a sort of certificate at the end with a picture of their own brain. Um, just to highlight this issue of data quality, um, the top row there is good quality data. We've got a structural image on the, the left side um, and a functional image on the right. And I'll just play the functional image for you. You can see very little movement. You see a little bit of pulsing as blood gets pumped up through the middle of the brain, but very still brain. The brain on the bottom here has moved a lot during the structural scan. You can see it's very 
blurry, just the same as if someone was running through a photograph. Um, and this makes it very difficult to sort of be able to identify the boundaries between different structures. Um, and if I show you um, the functional scan, you can see that bouncing around looks more like they're headbanging at a concert than, than lying still. Um, and this sort of data, data really becomes unusable. And once again, that, that wastes dollars and time. Um, but what's becoming more um, uh, noticed these days is that even in good usable quality data, motion is still having a big impact on some of the metrics that we get out. So it can affect the cortical thickness measures or the long range sort of functional connectivity measures. Um, and where this becomes really problematic is when you've got, you're comparing two groups and there is more motion in one group than the other, because that can then artificially give um, differences in the brain metrics. Um, what's, this is just a slide from some work that one of my PhD students is looking at, where she's been looking at the head motion in the MRI scanner. Um, and obviously children with ADHD have greater head motion, um, but they also have poorer sustained attention. When we look at just those dimensionally, those children with poor sustained attention also have higher head motion. So what this is sort of sh showing is that rather than just being sort of an artifact of, of ADHD, having head motion as an artifact, it's really interwound within the phenotype and the presentation of ADHD. So simply getting rid of data with lots of motion might not necessarily be the right answer or regressing out um, the influence of motion might be actually regressing out the, the Feban type of interest. So there's a particular challenge across the field at the moment. Other issues when looking at children and adolescents, obviously, braces. I mean, children with braces can go into the scanner, doesn't cause them any harm, but it causes just big distortions to the magnetic field. So this, these MRI images down the bottom, that individual doesn't have a gaping hole in the front of their head. Um, that's a distortion due uh, to the magnetic field based off the braces. And this significantly impairs functional images much worse than structural images. All right, so that was just some of the few challenges of working with children. But what I'm going to talk to you now is um, a paper that came out earlier this year, um, which was a, the first key baseline paper from our data, trying to overcome some of the these limitations. <clears throat> so when we look at um, some of the existing MRI data in, in ADHD, there's once again, like their clinical phenotype, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the findings about what brain regions are involved. A lot of the early studies, um, you know, based on a priori theories, really just focused on um, deep brain striatal basal ganglia structures, volumes, as well as the prefrontal cortex, like those in the, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, but as imaging um, techniques and technology has advanced and the resolution has got better, we've been able to look at focusing on the, whether the cortical thickness and the surface area, as well as some of the white matter um, microstructure. Um, and then in the bottom left-hand corner there, that's really the only other longitudinal cohort in ADHD. And this is almost 10 years ago now, um, but has sort of suggested there might be this delay in maturation where by late adolescence, um, ADHD brains catch up with uh, typical controls. But there's been a sort of a lot of inconsistencies. Um, for example, in the top right-hand corner there, this is actually a large, uh, what they call mega analysis. So multiple sites from around the world, this consortium have all come together. They use the same processing pipeline to pull out the same bits of data, and then they pull them together. And, you know, this is just one brain region, and it does show that the chordates are overall smaller in children with ADHD. But you can see a lot of variability between sites there, and, and even as four or five sites that show greater volume um, in ADHD. So, and so most of the recent meta-analysis, whether it's in structural diffusion or resting state data, are really finding very little, if, if any, 
consistency in, in brain regions across ADHD. This is a real problem. The one thing about most of that data though is they typically will be looking at one aspect of the brain. They will look at the volume or the thickness or the surface area or white matter properties. But this, you know, we know that these structures don't operate in isolation and particularly when we're looking over development, they don't develop in isolation. This, this figure just shows you just some, sort of the different trajectories as the brain develops in, in different brain regions and how there's different tempos and timings of that um, development in whether it's cortical thickness or the white matter volume or the different microstructural properties of white matter. So there's been some advances in statistical analysis that now allow us to be able to model sort of patterns of covariation across imaging modalities. So just to introduce the sort of concept of what we're trying to do here, this pro the technique we use is called a linked independent component analysis, which is stems from, a, from just independent component analysis, which has been used for a long time and not just in imaging. This comes from any sort of um, signal detection. And the sort of scenario to think about, and our brains are very good at doing this, is, is think about being a, a party You've got this single sound source coming into your ears, but your brain can take spatial and temporal components of that to pull out different components so that you can dissociate different people speaking or the band playing, the trumpeter. So your brain's very good at doing this and it's been now applied to neuroimaging techniques for quite a long time to, to try and identify, say, artifacts within the data or more recently for that resting state. So to be able to identify parts of the brain that have a similar time course um, across the sequence so that even though an individual's at rest, we can still pull out a motor network or a visual network or an attention network. So linked ICA is just taking that a step further to look at not just what areas that co-vary within an imaging modality, but also what varies across different imaging modalities. Um, so that's what we did with our data. We took all our um, brain volume data, cortical thickness, surface area, as well as two white matter microstructural measures, which is fractional isotropy, or FA, and mean diffusivity, or MD. And we put, extracted 25 spatially independent components, or brain patterns, that varied um, or co-varied together. And you can see those 25 components in the bottom right hand corner, how they were made up. Some of them were heavily driven by one particular um, metric, say for example, surface area, but others are a fairly mixed um, contribution from different imaging modalities. So these are done in a completely data driven way. Then on the phenotypic side, we took a heap of um, different phenotypic variables loosely categorized into individual factors such as the subject's age, weight, or puberty stage. Clinical factors, so I've mentioned this, you know, moving away from a categorical ADHD or not to looking at dimensions. So we've taken their symptom dimensions as well as whether they've got um, comorbidities. We took a, a bunch of um, cognitive factors like their IQ, their academic functioning, working memory, sustained attention. We have some retrospective perinatal factors such as their birth weight and whether they spent time in a neonatal intensive care unit or whether their, parent, their mothers smoked or drank alcohol during pregnancy. And then a range of family factors as well such as parent education, parenting styles, family quality of life, stressful life events. So what we wanted to do is, is to try and account for a lot of this heterogeneity we're finding both in the imaging literature as well as um, across the heterogeneity that's seen within the populations. We took these whole lot of phenotypic factors that vary. We took these brain factors, uh, brain patterns in a data driven way and we looked at multivariate association. So can we reveal associations between the subject's phenotype and their brain patterns? This was done using a canonical correlation analysis and it pulled out four significant independent relationships and I'll step through those over the next few slides. <laughs> 
So the first one, I'll, I'll firstly just orientate you to the figure because this is the format that the, the presented in the next few slides. You've got um, five rows there. That's the, the brain volume at the top, followed by the diffusion factors, FA and MD, cortical thickness, and then cortical area. Warmer colors are increases and cooler colors are decreases. So what this is showing you is whole brain across different imaging modalities, this pattern of increases and decreases across the brain that were associated with the um, phenotypic variables. Now this first one's not particularly exciting or interesting. It was mainly driven by their overall head size, but as we might expect, it was, you know, head size has been associated previously with being male, you know, have, males have larger head sizes. Um, uh, larger head sizes typically have better cognitive performance, um, comes from better socioeconomic status and had a higher birth weight to start off with. But we can then, remove that variance of head size before moving to the next factor. And we're referring to this as our marker of development. So independent of the head size, this pattern of increases and decreases across that whole brain was heavily driven by the individual's weight, puberty stage and age. Um, on the clinical side, um, it was on the, the inverse, there was less association less associated with medication and also hyperactivity. That figure only shows the ones that were associated less than 0 0.001, but there are other significant factors there, which including hyperactivity. And if we flip that around the other way, what that says is that if an individual has a brain that's less, development, less developmentally mature than their peers, uh, they were more likely to have hyperactivity and be medicated. However, the third marker was really what we're defining as our ADHD phenotype. So this particular pattern of brain uh, increases and decreases across those imaging modalities was heavily associated with hyperactivity. Also, it was associated with inattention, but hyperactivity explains sort of twice the variance that, than inattention. So these individuals were also more likely to be male, older, but less pubertally developed, more likely to have comorbidities of, of autistic symptoms, more likely to be medicated, more likely to have stressful life events, have less consistent parenting, poorer quality of life, and more likely to have spent time in a neonatal intensive care unit. Our last marker, um, which was not quite as robust as the others, but was a marker of um, cognition. So this wasn't representative of overall IQ, but it was a particular pattern of cognitive deficits. So the ch these children were more likely to um, have poor academic achievement, um, poor language skills, poor visual spatial reasoning, um, poor cognitive flexibility. Um, their mothers were more likely to have smoked during pregnancy. On a clinical aspect, it was associated actually less with ADHD and more with irritability, which is very interesting because irritability is often, um, uh, has a high comorbidity with ADHD um, and this really has pulled it apart as, as separate components, which is really quite nice. So we're, we're kind of really excited that they, in a data-driven way, it's actually pulled out these separate components that have all been in some way related to ADHD. You know, brain, overall brain size, development, obviously the ADHD phenotype, and also cognitive profiles. So even though we didn't want to start out looking at a categorical approach, we wanted to look at this dimensionally, Given that there was kind of a heavy ADHD phenotype brain pattern, we, we looked to see whether this could be differentiated categorically. And we could, that brain pattern did significantly differentiate between ADHD and controls, but the effect size is not huge. You can see there was a lot of overlap there. But importantly, our other variables, our other markers of development and cognition didn't significantly differentiate ADHD. So we thought this was really nice in our data, but we wanted to think, well, you know, can our marker of brain uh, of ADHD actually predict ADHD in an independent cohort? So there are some other um, cohorts available that are publicly publicly available. Um, this one, the ADHD 200 cohort. Now they didn't have the full multimodal imaging that we acquired, but just simply taking their structural volume data and applying our brain marker to that, we were able to. Um, predict from our marker of head size, predicted um, overall head size in that independent cohort, 
our marker of development um, predicted age in that cohort, but importantly, that, that marker of development didn't predict ADHD or IQ, whereas our marker of ADHD did predict ADHD symptoms in that cohort. And interestingly, it, it predicted it stronger, stronger in hyperactivity than in attention in the same way that it did in our data. Um, and then our cognitive marker di didn't predict anything in that cohort, but there wasn't cognitive measures other than IQ. But if you remember, IQ wasn't associated with that component. So just in summary of this, this paper, what we did is took this data-driven analysis to, with multimodal imaging and multi-informant phenotypic data. We identified this sort of novel set of brain images that was able to account for variation in the children's development, clinical factors, as well as cognitive factors. And these, all these factors have been to some extent associated with ADHD. So, you know, it might be that the ADHD is a summation at different levels of these factors which have distinct neuroanatomical foundations, which may then what explain why we have such heterogeneity in the findings. Um, and importantly, we were able to predict this in an independent cohort. Um, all right, so that's just a key baseline paper. We've got lots of other students and things working on different projects at the moment. But sort of what's coming next with this, this cohort and this data set? As I mentioned, we've just finished the recently finished the longitudinal imaging. So I'm really excited about getting stuck into looking at how these brains change over time and how they change for those that um, have persistently poor outcome versus, versus a better outcome. Other things that we're doing with this cohort is I mentioned this large mega analysis before. This is a, an international consortium known as Enigma. We have a range of different working groups. So we've been contributing some of our data towards this consortium for the ADHD working group. Um, we've also been collecting uh, genetic samples from these kids and they're currently being genotyped. Um, and this data is also contributing to a larger international consortium, the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium. Um, and through some other funding, we are currently doing some epigenetic testing. If you're not familiar with epigenetics, our DNA, our genetics is stable, it's the same in, in, all, in all cells, but our epigenetics is kind of the switches that turn on and off gene expression, um, and that, that ha happens naturally across our lifespan and our development, but it can also be influenced by environmental factors. So can we see sort of different epigenetic factors that are associated with um, the sort of functional outcomes with ADHD? So these are some of the, the cool new prospects to, to stay tuned to. Um, and, you know, I haven't done all this work alone. There's been a, a big group of um, staff and students as well as the families that have been involved in coming in over multiple years. So I just want to acknowledge their contribution and um, I'll open the floor um, for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was great. Um, so listeners, feel free to type in your questions in the question box and I'll read them out to Tim for him to answer. So we've got a few questions that came in throughout the presentation. One from Brett. Looking at the variables, have you looked at phen phenotypical data against matrix measures like the DSM used in autism? Be interesting to see if ADHD specific patterns map to imaging. Um, so is the question, I think, assume the question is sort of looking at that overlap between ADHD and autism. Yes, that's certainly something that we are looking at within our data set. A number of students have, um, have been looking at that overlap. One particular looking at the imaging data. Um, um, she's currently looking at the white matter tracks involved in sort of emotion regulation and looking at that overlap. Um, so yes, that, that, that's certainly questions that we're, we're looking at and I think that's sort of a big area of interest at the moment, particularly with the changes now to the DSM that allow that um, um, comorbid diagnosis. Thanks for the question. Lachlan has asked, has anyone looked at possible correlations with psychometric data? Um, can you just clarify, Lachlan, what you, you mean by psychometric data there? 
Oh, personality. Um, that's it's not a literature that I'm across, um, but we actually have been. I think in maybe our most recent wave have collected some sort of temperament measures. Um, so that's something that we have potentially got in the data um, to look at. Uh, yeah, interesting. Thanks. Um, Tim, perhaps you can tell our listeners more about how they can find out more information on your research. Yeah, um, certainly. So um, we we have a children's attention project um, um, uh, website that's operated actually through the, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. But if you come directly to um, the School of Psychology at Deakin University, the Brain, De Brain and Cognitive Development Lab, um, there's some links there. Um, feel free to email me, um, get in contact with me if anyone's interested in um, um, any aspect of our study. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. And we've got a question from Ben. Who, uh, he said, so you mentioned that the study investigated factors that predicted better and poorer outcomes for these individuals with ADHD. Is that work that is still in progress or were there some answers? Yeah. Um, so, yes, we've, um, so in terms of that baseline non-imaging data, there is, uh, we're currently working on our the three-year longitudinal paper at the moment, so I won't talk about those findings just yet. Um, but in terms of the imaging um, trajectories, we haven't got to yet. We've only just finished that third wave of data collection earlier this year. So that's things we're currently working on, but please stay tuned. That's great. Thank you so much, Tim. We might wrap it up there, but if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to email Tim directly. Um, and thank you so much for listening in today uh, and participating in today's Deakin Alumni and School of Psychology webinar. Thank you.